I was 17 years old, and I was a student at the University of Notre Dame, and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. Sound familiar? Yeah. And um, so I did what every student at a liberal arts college does when he has no idea what to do with his life. I took a psychology course. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, it was held in a huge auditorium. It was Intro to Psychology. It's a big auditorium with, uh, you know, that went up in the back and it was dark in the back. And so naturally, I sat in the back so that I wouldn't be noticed. Um, I could easily avoid detection in the back. And, um, you know, it was what you'd expect. It was uh, taught by three different professors, actually. So it's it really quite well done, but kind of the normal stuff. It was three divisions. It was co uh, cognitive and social psych, it was biological psych, and it was behavioral science. And, um, you know, it was long and boring lectures, and it was voluminous and dispiriting exams, and, um, you know, that sort of thing, the way they do it at most universities. Uh, but there was a, a bright spot to this course, and it was, it was the guy who taught the behavioral science bit. His name was Chris Anderson, Dr. Chris Anderson. And uh, something about Dr. Anderson stuck with me. He used to start most of his lectures with a, a story. And, um, and a lot of these kind of stuck with me over the years, and so I wanted to share one of these with you guys today. Um, so he started off by saying, have you ever wanted to impress somebody, to win them over? And immediately my 17-year-old self he heard that as a secret and scientifically validated way to meet girls. <laughs> <laughs> so I was totally tuned in at that point. Um, yeah, yeah, let's take out the notepad and uh, get ready to, to write this down, because it's going to be good. And then he, fo then he followed that up by saying, um, OK, so it, it, here's, here's what you do. You, you get to know the person. You meet them. You find out what they like. You find out what they dislike. And uh, let's say their favorite thing in the world is, let's say, hockey. And, all right, so that's not very romantic. Um, and, uh, you know, but it was Notre Dame. And so hockey was pretty popular there. Good chance she was going to like hockey at that point. Um, so what you do is then get some hockey tickets. And you wait until just the right moment. And then you deliver the hockey tickets, right? You sort of deliver the hockey tickets to her. And, um, and I'm hearing her, but you know, he's like the person. And, uh, and then the person will forever think of you as a big fat hockey ticket. <laughs> okay, um, but the, the point was you'd make a mark and the warning was that you might be thought of as forevermore a big fat hockey ticket. And, and so I've thought about this over the years um, quite a bit and it made me, in thinking about this talk, I sort of thought, hey, maybe what part of what he was saying was uh, a simpler version of this famous quote that you might have read before by Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And so uh, I think part of the message here is in behavior, in leadership, it's what you say and do that makes people feel a certain way. And that's what's memorable or not. So let me give you some examples. Have you ever had a, uh, have you ever felt stress because of something that your boss or your company said or did? I'm seeing head nods. <laughs> uh, have you ever felt deflated because of something that your boss or company said or did? Have you ever felt energized because of something that your boss or company said or did? How about your spouse? or significant other? How about your friends? How about your kids? I have a four-year-old, and, and a few weeks ago he said, Daddy, your belly's getting really fat. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went out and bought a Fitbit, which, 
which, uh, which counts your steps and your calories if you haven't. Um, we've mentioned these so many times during the conference, you'd think we sell them, but we don't. We're just big believers in constant feedback and reinforcement for, some, for the things that you want to achieve. Um, so again, we're back to the behavior of these folks having an impact on you and your behavior having an impact on them. Another thing I think that Dr. Anderson was saying in his example was that it's environment that drives your behavior. And so yeah, the hockey tickets, those are part of the environment. And your behavior, the, that's part of the environment. And, and the behavior of others, that's part of the environment. They influence you, you influence them. If you, if, you, uh, if you think about each of these environments shown here, you can go to the beach, for example, and you might imagine yourself on the beach having a, the tasty beverage of your choice. <laughs> One that you wouldn't maybe have in the office or couldn't have in the office. Um, you might imagine yourself kind of, you know, wearing, th wearing clothes here that you wouldn't wear there. Maybe you wear your Speedo here and <laughs> not there or anywhere, for that matter. <laughs> uh, you know, you do things in an office environment that you don't do at the beach. You do things at a football match, game, that you, that you don't do at the beach or at, at the office. You add one person into that, any of these environments, and you're likely to change the conversations that are happening. We can all imagine that happening. So one of the things that, um, as you learn more about behavioral science, we find Leaders stop focusing on, uh, okay, so how many hockey tickets should I give out for good behavior? And instead, start focusing on, all right, what's the, what's the role of my behavior? What's the downstream impact of my behavior on other people? And that's really where the gold is. What's the downstream impact of my behavior? And I, we'd argue that it's vital to understand and study the downstream impact of what you say and do day to day on other people. So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a, a CEO who had learned, uh, who, had, who had been studying behavioral science for a couple of years, and he came in and spoke at a conference and, and told a story and, and said that uh, I just moved into the role and was under cost-cutting pressure. Okay, and so brought his team together and started looking through last year's spend item by item to figure out, yeah, what can we do differently? How, how can we do this better? And, and uh, so, CEO is looking through the list and said, comes along to one of the items and says, "We spent what on international travel?" And the entire team kind of looks around nervously, and uh, no one says anything. And then they move on to the next item. And then he admits that uh, nine months later, he finds out that someone in that meeting had gone away and enacted a, a blanket policy, preventing, eliminating all international travel. I'm seeing some laughs. It sounds familiar to some of you guys. Um, so you may think, well, that's success, right? I mean, you didn't have to do anything. <laughs> they just went away and read sort of, that's tel you know, telekinesis. Um, it's, it's that easy. But the, the, uh, when they started to look at it a little closer, what they found was that the revenues that were generated by that international travel were 10 times what they were spending. Yeah. Um, so... This reaction during the meeting that the CEO had, had, an, had a, over time, it had uh, a negative downstream impact, right? So this is the typical kind of organizational structure, right? And if you think about leadership, it's really not that complex. Uh, the job of this person is to create the conditions where these people do their best, and the job of these people is to create the conditions where these people do their best and, and so forth, right? What the, uh, the problem with this notion happens when somebody here, a manager, goes and then starts messing around down here trying to make changes with the workforce without engaging the, the leaders that report to him or her, right? Um, so what you get there is a whole bunch of uncertainty among these folks and yeah, the manager who's done something with the workforce forgets about it the next day, and these guys never forget about it. So 
So I come back to the I come back to the Chris Anderson story, and I'm thinking, all right. So a couple things I want to say about that is, uh, you know, one is, 27 years later, I'm still talking about this this story, right? Um, and so he definitely left an impact. He definitely had an impact on me. The other thing is that it's occurred to me that this is not about hockey tickets uh, or anything tangible for that matter. This is about what Maya Angelou said. It's about how you make people feel. And beyond that, it's what you say and what you do and how that makes people feel. One of the most common things that we hear from people who take our courses is uh, about halfway through they'll say, oh, I have to admit something that, you know, when we started this course, I really thought that this was all about fixing them, those people, those other people. But now I've realized it's not actually about me. It's about my behavior. So when you're going through the rest of the day and you're thinking about kind of what can I take away from behavioral science, what I'd like you to remember is it's not about them. It's about you. Thank you.